Hi everybody, welcome to this episode of the Heart Podcast. Today I am talking to Professor Varani and Dr. Mata from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and we're discussing their recent publication, which is called Recreational Substance Use Among Patients with Premature Atherosclerotic Cardiovascular Disease. We have a really interesting discussion about the impact of these substances on premature cardiovascular disease, which also includes stroke and PVD, and what we might do about it. I hope you enjoy the show. So what I might do to start with is just ask you guys to introduce yourself. Perhaps uh, we'll start off with Dr. Varani. Can you tell me who you are, where you work, and, and what you do, Dr. Varani? Sure. So I'm Salim Varani. I'm a professor of medicine uh, in the sections of cardiovascular research at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. At the same time, I am a staff cardiologist at the Michael E. DeBakey Veterans Affairs Medical Center, again, based in Houston, Texas. And my area of interest is cardiovascular disease prevention, both primary and secondary. And Dr. Mata, would you like to introduce yourself for the uh, Heart Podcast audience, please? Absolutely. So my name is Dhruv Mata. I'm a first year uh, cardiology fellow here at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Uh, prior to my uh, clinical fellowship, I did a one year of outcomes uh, health research fellowship. And my interests are in uh, outcomes research pertaining to premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, as well as interventional cardiology. Great. And you guys have recently written a original research paper uh, in heart, which is called Recreational Substance Use Amongst Patients with Premature Atherosclerotic Cardiovascular Disease. And I really wanted to get you both on the podcast to to talk about this work. Maybe we can start off, Dr. Varani, by you telling us about some background to the study um, in terms of recreational use, uh, drug use. How common is this and uh, what kind of impacts does it have on the cardiovascular system? What do, you, what do we know about this going into this study? Yeah, so first of all, uh, thanks, Dr. Rudd, for uh, having actually both me and Dr. Mata on this uh, podcast. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we think it's an important topic, of course, that's the reason we worked on it. And, and the reason we picked this up, now the association between recreational substance use and uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease is well known. The reason we actually looked at this again uh, was for various reasons. Number one, that we wanted to assess the association between uh, recreational substance use and premature cardiovascular disease in young people, because that's the area that we are very interested in. As Dr. Mata said, that that's the area where he's really done quite a bit of work uh, from this particular registry uh, that we use for these analyses as well. That's number one. The second is that when we talk about cardiovascular disease, we talk about cardiovascular disease as not just heart disease. So we also talk about ischemic cerebrovascular disease. We also look at ischemic peripheral arterial disease. So it's not just ischemic heart disease. That was the second reason they wanted look at the continuum of risk across all the domains of cardiovascular disease. And then the third aspect was we wanted to see, because young people, when they're using one substance, they're not just using one substance. Generally, they end up using a lot of substances. So is there a, what is the interaction in terms of, uh, you know, when you, when you use multiple drugs, is the risk additive? That's the other thing that we wanted to look at. Now, you know, you talked about what is the population level impact. I think these are right times to be talking about it. Uh, I don't know about other countries, but in US, we know that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, substance abuse has increased tremendously as it does with any pandemic. Even the past pandemics, the same thing has happened. If you look at mental health, that has deteriorated quite significantly. And as a result of that, substance abuse has gone up. So if we look at the data actually up to the June of 2020, uh, the age group where the most increase in substance abuse was seen was actually the young people. So it has tremendous public health significance as well, especially in the middle of this pandemic. And those were some of the reasons that we started out looking at this particular topic. Uh, and and you know that's that's really why we pursued this particular analysis. And is it right to say you weren't just interested in the acute effects of some of these recreational drugs? So we, we're, many of us as cardiologists will be familiar with cocaine abuse and and you know acute myocardial infarction. You're interested really in the sort of chronic effects on the heart. Is that right? 
That is correct, uh, that we are more interested in the long-term effects of these. And, and you very rightly pointed out, you know, you look at cocaine, even there's data with amphetamines, especially synthetic amphetamines, that blood pressure can have a lot of variability uh, with acute use of it. Uh, but we are more interested in these chronic long-term habits uh, and working with a data set that is quite rich in terms of availability of variables and very uh, uh, complete data set, we were able to actually ascertain those things. So exactly right. And Dr. Mata, what was your hypothesis uh, going into this work? Absolutely. So as Dr. Virani uh, pointed out, that was the background for our analysis here. So really the primary aim for our analysis here was to uh, evaluate uh, the prevalence of recreational substances and not just uh, overall, but each domain of uh, recreational substance use among patients with early onset or premature cardiovascular disease. And um, with cardiovascular disease, we looked at each domain of cardiovascular disease, ischemic cerebrovascular disease, ischemic heart disease, as well as peripheral vascular disease. And besides evaluating just the prevalence, uh, we also wanted to evaluate the association between use of these substances and um, early onset or premature atherosclerotic disease in these young to middle-aged adults. So our, our big hypotheses were that we hypothesized that there to be a positive association between uh, each domain of recreational drug use and premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And, and we hypothesized that this association would be independent of, of, of the traditional cardiometabolic risk factors such as diabetes and, and uh, hypertension and dyslipidemia. Um, and we also hypothesized that, um, as Dr. Brani pointed out, we wanted to look at the uh, dose response or graded, um, if there is a graded response. So we hypothesized that, uh, that there may exist a graded response in the number of substances that are being used and um, the magnitude of risk uh, of premature ASCVD. So those were the main uh, big uh, hypotheses that we uh, looked at before, before starting our analysis. And what methods did you guys use to address this hypothesis? You mentioned a, a database. Uh, what population did you study, Professor Barani? Sure thing. So we had uh, we have this registry that actually Dr. Mahata uh, played a very key role in developing during his uh, uh, one year of health outcomes research that he did with us. Uh, and we call it the vital registry veterans with premature cardiovascular disease. So if you look at the entire VA healthcare system, which is one of the largest healthcare systems in US, uh, and one of the very early ones to have a, a very uh, uh, strong electronic medical record system, in that entire VA system, we have about 1.2 to 1.3 million patients with cardiovascular disease. Out of that, we developed a registry of premature cardiovascular disease, which is the vital registry. Uh, that's about uh, 140, 145,000 patients. So these are men who've had any form of cardiovascular disease before the age of 55 or women with premature cardiovascular disease before the age of 65. Now, these are the definitions that are accepted by both American and European guidelines in terms of defining premature uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So that's the definition we used. And we had approximately 135, 136,000 patients for this particular analysis, uh, which were premature. And then we had 1.1, 1.15 million patients who were non-premature cardiovascular disease. So those were the two groups that we compared. Uh, you know, in terms of assessing cardiovascular disease, we used what we call the ICD-9 uh, codes, as well as some of the procedural codes to identify you know, uh, stent bypass surgery, stents in the lower extremities for peripheral arterial diseases, as well as carotid arteries. So we use both uh, ICD-9 codes as well as the CPT codes to identify our data set. And of course, we always have to make sure uh, that we have enough sensitivity and specificity for identifying this. So we have done some chart reviews to say that the specificity for identification of these patients is upwards of 90%. Uh, in our data set. Once we did that, we identified a lot of these covariates or confounders. I mean, we know that premature cardiovascular disease also has very strong association with traditional risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, uh, high cholesterol. So we assess those using these uh, the EMR data set. And then the analyses we did were comparing those with non-premature cardiovascular disease to those with premature cardiovascular disease adjusting for a lot of these confounders, including age, 
to see that if the use of substance abuse was associated with premature cardiovascular disease. So we had three big buckets of substances. We had uh, uh, tobacco use, we had alcohol use, and then we had recreational substance use in which we had cannabis, we had cocaine, we had amphetamine. So those were the three big buckets of, of, of substances that we evaluated. And then we did some of these analyses to, some of them were visual, for example, looking at what happens when you use one substance versus two versus three, what happens with that? What happens when you adjust for alcohol when you're looking at tobacco? Because people use those together as well. So that could be one of the confounders for each of those. And then the other thing we looked at when we looked at our raw data, which was very striking, was the gender-related interactions. That is there an effect modification? Do we see higher impact of these substances in women compared to men? So those were some of the analyses that we did. Uh, and 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 then you know the data set that we use for these particular analyses. And how did you actually ascertain uh, the extent of alcohol, tobacco, and recreational drug use? Was this self-reported uh, in in the medical records? So this could be both self-reported as well as ascertained by a, a clinician who's entering data. This was done using uh, the ICD-9 codes for each of these, tobacco, okay. alcohol, and each of the substances. So now it could be that the patient mentioned it to the clinician, and that's why they captured it. Or it could be that the clinician had a suspicion to measure it uh, using maybe a urine drug screening test or something, and then entering an ICD-9 code pertaining to that particular substance. Perfect. And Dr. Mata, how would you um, describe the main findings of the study? Do you want to go ahead and give us some of the, the top level uh, results? Absolutely. So I think uh, there were three main findings that are important to highlight for, for the listeners. Um, the, the first uh, main finding was uh, that use of each category of the recreational drug uh, substances were independently associated with premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in these young adults. Um, uh, and these were independent of the cardiometabolic uh, factors that Dr. Mirani mentioned. So, for example, tobacco use uh, was independently associated with roughly two times higher risk of premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Alcohol use was roughly associated with uh, um, one and a half times higher risk. And the illicit drug use was roughly associated with two and a half to three times higher risk of premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, the, the second main finding that, that uh, we want to portray is, is that we did see a, a fairly significant polysubstance use, uh, a graded response with polysubstance use. So we saw that patients with increasing number of substances uh, uh, being used had a correspondingly increase in their risk of premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, for example, patients who used four or more substances, their uh, had roughly nine-fold higher increase uh, in, in their uh, risk of premature atherosclerotic disease. Um, and lastly, as, as Dr. Virani had mentioned, we, we looked at gender interactions. So what we found is uh, that female users of these recreational substances have a stronger association with premature atherosclerotic disease as compared to their male counterparts. So just to put Put in perspective, female users of these drugs uh, had roughly two to seven times higher odds of premature uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease as compared to the male users who had roughly one to three times higher odds of uh, premature uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So I think those were the, the three key findings that, that are important to highlight here. And Dr. Varani, do we have any idea as to the, the mechanisms that might promote early cardiovascular disease? Um, following alcohol, tobacco, and recreational drug usage? I mean, it may be hard to tease out from this work, but what's out there in the literature for people to be aware of? Yeah, no, I'm, you very rightly pointed out, uh, this is, of course, not mechanistic work. Uh, this is more of an association-related study. But what we know from prior work are the following things. Uh, number one, all of these substance use uh, have been shown to be associated with uh, uh, endothelial dysfunction, endothelial damage, oxidative stress, as well as cardiometabolic abnormalities. For example, alcohol we know does a lot of cardiometabolic abnormalities that have been shown very clearly. And at the same time, uh, we mentioned earlier that acute use of a lot of these substances is associated with increased shear stress. Now, if one does it on a continual basis as well, I think it is fair to assume that that shear stress can also affect the endothelium in, 
in, in, a, in a way that we, of course, don't think is favorable. The other aspect of this is that in, in to be fully transparent here, these are associations, so there could be other confounders as well that we have not picked up. And I think as, as, as somebody who works in the health outcomes area, we have to be open to that. Mm. There could be that some of these risk factors uh, co-associate with some with some social determinants of health as well, whether that's poverty, whether that's lack of exercise, whether that is poor diet as well, that we may not have picked up and could not adjust for in our analyses as well. So it is, but at, the, at a clinician level, I would still argue that if I am seeing use of these uh, uh, substances, it does give me an idea that this is a patient who's high risk. How much of that is contributed by these substances? Well, we have some effect sizes in our paper, but even if some of that is still confounded by other things, it's still important to identify this high risk subset. And you know, those who are in the statistics would argue that these are not odds ratios of 1.1, 1.2. We're looking at odds ratios upwards of two and for poly substance use upwards of seven and eight for a confounder to really be driving that association that has to be a confounder that's very, very, very strong. So I think we're fairly comfortable in saying that these substances are associated. Maybe the effect size may be a little bit less than what we are seeing here, could be confounded by other things as well, but clinicians should keep that in mind and look at the patient in total uh, and not just get focused on the substance use. Look at the social determinants of health as well. Look at traditional risk factors as well, but definitely identify these patients as, as very high risk patients. And just while we're, we're talking about the limitations which you, you've brought up of the study, are there anything, any other limitations that people should be aware of that you want to mention at this stage before we go on to conclusions? Uh, I think so. And I'm glad that this is, we're talking about it because it's it's a right segue into the limitations of the paper. One is that we don't have the uh, duration of use of these. That's a limitation of our data set. We don't have the dose of each of these substances. Of course, somebody smoking 10, 10 cigarettes versus 20 cigarettes is different. We talked about social determinants of health. We don't have those. Those can sometimes be present at the same time and be the drivers of some of these associations as well. So those are some of the uh, major limitations that we have uh, of this particular study that your readers as well as the uh, our listeners should keep in mind while while interpreting uh, these results and of course medical therapy could vary as well i'll give you one example that if i am using a substance and if i have premature cardiovascular disease or if i don't have premature cardiovascular disease it is likely that if i have hypertension and if i'm using a substance i may not be as adherent to my blood pressure lowering therapy compared to somebody who's not. So that may also increase the risk. So we did not look at control of traditional risk factors. And again, these are limitations of all the studies that we see that readers and, 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 and listeners of this podcast should keep in mind that we looked at risk factors, but not risk factor control per se, which could again be affected in a patient who's using substances. Of course, absolutely. And, and Dr. Mata, would you like to give us a few conclusions that uh, people should take away from your work? Absolutely. So I think the, the first conclusion um, that that's important to um, take away is uh, that among patients with premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, there's a higher prevalence of all uh, recreational substances, um, and that includes tobacco use, alcohol use, and, and various illicit drug use. Uh, and then within each subgroup of recreational substances, each each of these subgroups are independently associated with a higher likelihood of premature atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And this association is independent of the, the traditional cardiovascular risk factors that we think about. And then the second thing is there is a significant graded response relationship between the number of substances that a person is using and their risk and likelihood of early onset um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, and we had even looked at this graded response uh, um, after adjusting for concomitant alcohol and tobacco use. And even after that adjustment, we see there is a greater response uh, relationship between the number of substances used as well as uh, the risk of uh, early onset atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And finally, um, um, female users of these substances have a higher magnitude of risk uh, for premature atherosclerotic disease as compared to their male counterparts. And that's something to note. It's not, uh, it's, a, it's a hypothesis generating uh, conclusion, but um, that's something to, to take away from this paper as well. And finally, I think based on 
our conclusions and analyses here, I think a, a, a big message to take away is, is perhaps the policymakers, uh, perhaps this is time to uh, look into some quality improvement initiatives to improve the rate of screening for these substances, as well as consider perhaps increasing funding or access to drug cessation programs um, would be another avenue for policymakers to make a big difference in this uh, arena. That's a fantastic summary. Thank you so much. And maybe we can just finish with Professor Varani. Could you, anything else you'd like to share and what studies are, are you working on next in, in your department? So I think I'll start with what, where this work takes us and then we can talk about the larger implications. And, and some of those were very aptly uh, mentioned by Dr. Mahata as well. I think the question is, yes, we've identified a problem, but you know we all work in large healthcare systems. I do personally identifying risk is one thing. What do we do with that is I think a, a more important question. So the question is that can we actually work with our colleagues uh, to develop an intervention that, that actually addresses substance use in young people that's going to be the key, at least in the healthcare system that we are at. Uh, I think verifying some of these findings, especially the gender interaction that we saw, whether that pans out in other data sets as well, because that would be an important finding, especially from a messaging perspective, is there something else that we're very interested in. And then I think what are some of the other things that clinicians should keep in mind? I think this paper is timely in terms of the current pandemic we have. Uh, you know, we mentioned earlier about substance use. It's on the rise, and I think it's fair to say it's not just a U.S. phenomena. It's probably everywhere. Right. So clinicians should be very mindful of this when they're evaluating their patients. And when you see one substance, do ask about another substance, because as we see, it's a very graded association. Uh, so be very mindful of that when you're looking at your patients who are presenting with heart attacks or strokes or having PAD that you cannot explain uh, using traditional risk factors. But in young people, definitely it's always a good thing to, uh, to, to measure for these substances because then that opens up a discussion line where you can understand why they are using substances. And if that may also impact other therapies that we're giving to our patients, especially in terms of adherence to those therapies. So those are some messages that I have for our clinicians that they may want to be more mindful of this. This is out there, this is known, but just bringing it back to, uh, uh, to the front in terms of that we should be very mindful of these things. And then of course, we talked about interventions and these interventions, just talking to the patients, yeah, you should stop substance use. It's probably not gonna work. I think a lot of healthcare systems have a lot of uh, help available with counselors. Leveraging those counselors is going to be very important. Understanding that this is team-based care that's going to be required for this and being very mindful of what our patients are going through, especially these young patients. There's COVID everywhere right now. A lot of them have lost their jobs as well. They have families to take care of both their kids, their parents who may also be suffering from COVID and their devastation. They may actually have a family member that they have lost in this pandemic. So keeping that in mind, taking a very broad approach to this topic will be very, very helpful when we all as clinicians evaluate these patients. Perfect, that's a brilliant. Uh summary and it's been a real pleasure and a privilege to talk to you professor Farani and dr Mata. and i will make the uh, paper uh, free for everybody to read for the next few weeks after the podcast comes out and also a very nice editorial was written uh, about the paper with some lovely uh, a venn diagram which really i think summarizes the main points that you've uh, so eloquently made so uh, that'll also be available to everybody to read uh, thank you very much for joining me thanks for your time thank you so much 